So very interesting. We've got the testimony going on there with Curtis Wainwright Jr. giving play by play. He hasn't gotten quite yet to the murder as yet. Uh, I want to see if I can ask a few questions of my of my guests here. We've got quite an assortment here. Uh, I want to introduce you to Joseph McBride, a trial attorney here in New York, as well as Catherine Smith. Of all, as always, we have the uh, the great uh, Joseph Scott Morgan with us as well. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So. Joseph, I will throw this question to you first. Cooperating witness. I mean, that, that seems like quite the difficult obstacle to overcome. Um, what do you think would be the plan for the defense for cross-examination of this witness? Thank you, Brian. It's good to be here. So the plan seems to be obvious. Leave no stone unturned. Murder commitment, intelligence, access. You hear these words over and over and over again. The prosecutor is obviously sowing these things into the case to try to overcome the obvious hill here, which is a cooperating witness, an interested witness, a witness with his own motive and sense of purpose. Yeah. Now, it appears, just as I said it, that this witness is jumping right into what happened during the murder. So let's jump right into court and hear what he has to say. It appears they're approaching in there to get some more information. They're starting to walk their way through how this murder all went down. I'm going to have uh, Catherine Smith jump in on this one. I mean, it seems like the prosecution's got all the ingredients to bake this cake. I, I, I can't see what the defense really has here. Uh, at first I thought that the ex-girlfriend was like the star witness that really buried him. Now they've got a second one after that. I mean, is this just a done deal? We're just waiting for the verdict? It sure feels like it from here. You know, you never know what's going to happen, and obviously there's this inference, of course, that this is this cooperating witness has every motive to lie. But it certainly feels like, as all the evidence is stacking up, that it's really going against the defendant. Yeah. All right, Joseph Scott Smith, I can think of at least three or four arguments to make both witnesses seem like they're completely lying, they're completely interested, but I can't do that with the science. Where is the science gonna come into play here that's really gonna win the day for the prosecution or maybe the defense? You know, uh, Brian, I don't know that it's necessarily a matter of, of science as much as it is common sense because we have these guys, you know, uh, this one fellow giving uh, testimony relative to uh, putting together uh, what we refer to as a kill kit, uh, where, you know, they've got, you know, all manner of, of items in order to facilitate this. We also have him talking about uh, the garment. And, you know, logically, if we begin to kind of lay this out and look at it, uh, you know, in, in terms of linear time, you know, how, how did this progression work? And they're painting prosecution with this particular uh, witness uh, is painting quite the narrative. Uh, and it's they're making it very simple for the jury to follow the breadcrumbs evident from an evidentiary standpoint. Now, I'm, I'm, it'll be interesting to see how how the defense mitigates this because this is tough evidence to to try to you know to knock back. We had a great diagram there of of these benchmarks, you know, traveling down from Missouri and and heading down south. And wow, talk about bread that that those are literally electronic breadcrumbs. And so that's that's a beautiful piece of evidence right there. Yeah, uh, Joseph, I would agree with Joseph. These are, uh, to some extent, I don't think these are breadcrumbs. I think this is a whole loaves of bread that are just being dropped like by the side of the street. Like you, you could literally follow this case from a satellite and see what these guys did. I mean, I, I can't see a way out of this. Do you see something that I'm missing or is it just the prosecution got them dead to rights? Uh, I agree with Joseph. Uh, Common sense is the science of the street, and uh, their breadcrumbs and their hands are all over this. This is nearly impossible to overcome. Very powerful opening statement, as well as the testimony from the first witness, uh, the, the doctor and friend of the victim. Uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, I want you to jump in on this question first. When we're getting testimony about when someone first views the body uh, after they've been deceased or been killed, what comes to your mind specifically in terms of like post-mortem interval? Well, you know, you, you want to try to determine how long an individual has been down, Brian, because that is a big piece of scientific evidence. And many times, depending upon the jurisdiction you're in, uh, uh, the authorities at hand might not know to do that, they, or they might do it uh, inaccurately. And what's so powerful about here is that, you know, how often do you have a surgeon that shows up 
at the scene and they're the first person to to find a body like this he was able to do an assessment pretty quickly remember he he talked about the volume of blood he saw he checked for vitals he noticed i think he even used the term cold dead uh you know and they're gonna have a sense for this he knows that life has left at this moment in time so he becomes a very powerful witness uh from a scientific standpoint even though he's not a professional death investigator he's able to lend uh, his assessment in real time. And I think that this is, this is very important. Uh, and, you know, the prosecution did a good job of putting this guy up on stand because he, he really locks in the narrative at this point in time. I mean, to Joseph's credit to point, I mean, if, if even us as lawyers saw a dead body, we're not going to have the breadth of knowledge that a doctor would about viewing that body. Um, Catherine, to you, how powerful is that testimony coming from a doctor of all people, and then when you connect it with the opening statement of that story that just makes Jimmy Rogers seem berserk and crazy, I mean, like, what else is the jury to believe? That's the thing, I mean, it's really fortunate that the doctor did find her because not only is he able to perceive more than, I mean, I would freak out in a situation like that, right? He's probably more accustomed to seeing dead bodies and also can just perceive more accurately the injuries. Um, but then we hear this powerful opening statement. I mean, obviously, this wasn't just kill. This was intense overkill. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, we as defense attorneys know that you, you don't want to over or undersell in an opening statement. This prosecution is giving a lot of information play by play. So we would expect that the witness, that being Curtis Wainwright Jr., would give all of this information. If all that comes into evidence, I mean, what can the defense do to kind of fight back at that? I mean, it's hard evidence to overcome. The defense is obviously going to impeach the witness because he's very interested. But what I find interesting about this prosecutor is his approach. This is a very warm and endearing man. He's methodical, but you kind of feel like you're at the dinner table with him. And then he delivers these devastating facts, which, which completely brings you back and puts you in the back of your seat. There's, there's different types of uh, personalities at play here. And this is a person who lulls you into his narrative almost immediately. And that by itself is very hard for the other side to overcome. Yeah. yeah, it seems going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, but the only way you can figure that out is if you come back after the break here, the Long Crime Trial Network.